In A Song of Ice and Fire, there exist various different prophecies, all claiming to foretell the future of the world of A Song of Ice and Fire and that of its various characters. Some of these you probably have heard of before. For instance, there's the prophecy about Azor Ahai, as well as Quay's prophecies about Daenerys, and then there's even the Dothraki prophecy about the stallion that mounts the world. But in A Feast for Crows, we learn of a particular prophecy foretelling the destiny of a singular character. This, of course, is the prophecy foretold by Maggie the Frog regarding Cersei Lannister. In A Feast for Crows, we are introduced to Maggie's prophecy during one of Cersei's point of view chapters. As Cersei comes to terms with the deaths of both Tywin and Joffrey along with her newly gained position of power, she becomes overly paranoid about those who she claims are attempting to undermine her. Her paranoia and fears cause her to often ruminate on her past. And through this, we learn that a lot of Cersei's actions and beliefs regarding the Tyrells and her brother Tyrion stem from this very prophecy told to her as a young girl. In regards to Maggie the Frog herself, she originally hailed from the East, arriving in Lannisport as a young woman with her Westerosi husband. Apart from this, however, we know little else of Maggie. Even her true name remains a mystery and Maggie was likely a bastardization of the word Magi. Which brings to mind Miri Mazdur, as she too was known to be a Magi and a very powerful one at that. Miri Mazdur supposedly hailed from a shy, as do Melisandre and Quaithe, two other very mysterious women with supposed magical abilities. So it would not be surprising if Maggie herself originally comes from a shy, a region long associated with magic and prophecy. Regardless of Maggie's origins, however, her reputation in Westeros soon gave her great notoriety, eventually intriguing Cersei enough for her to make an effort to seek her out. Now, it's important to note that prior to Cersei's meeting with Maggie, she had become slightly enamored, okay, obsessed with Prince Rhaegar Targaryen. According to Cersei, when she was just a little girl, no more than six or seven, her father had promised her that she would marry Rhaegar. And so it was with the knowledge of the possible marriage to Prince Rhaegar, along with a combination of willfulness and curiosity, that led Cersei to visit the tent of Maggie the Frog on that fateful day. Maggie allowed both girls three questions each. And naturally, the first order of business for Cersei was to inquire after a possible marriage between Prince Rhaegar and herself. When will I wed the prince? she asked. Never, you will wed the king, Maggie replied. This, of course, confused Cersei at the time, and she reveals that for years she had assumed that the words meant that she would not marry Rhaegar until after King Aerys had died. At the time, though, a confused ten-year-old Cersei couldn't really help herself. I will be queen, though. Queen you shall be until there comes another, younger and more beautiful, to cast you down and take all that you hold dear, Maggie replied, which then left Cersei with one final question. Will the king and I have children? Oh, I, six and ten for him and three for you. Gold shall be their crowns and gold their shrouds. And when your tears have drowned you, the Valonqar shall wrap his hands about your pale white throat and choke the life from you. Some pretty bold statements to make, but as you could guess, Cersei didn't find them too appealing at the time. Her friend Malara, however, was still eager to ask her own three questions. Will I marry Jamie? Not Jamie, nor any other man. Worms will have your maiden head. Your death is here tonight, little one. Can you smell her breath? She is very close. Now, we later learn that Malara does indeed die soon after the foretelling, apparently by falling down a well, but it's heavily implied that it was actually Cersei who pushed Malara down the well. Now, unlike Cersei at the time of the foretelling, we have a bit of hindsight regarding Maggie's words. For instance, Maggie's reply to Cersei's first question is obviously referring to Robert Baratheon. As we know, Prince Rhaegar was killed during the Battle of the Trident, leading Robert to be crowned Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, soon after which Cersei and Robert were wed. The answer to Cersei's second question, however, is not so obvious and produces our first conundrum. Who is the younger and more beautiful queen, and how will she cast Cersei down and take all that she holds dear? But it's the third and final question, will the king and I have children, which produces the most interesting reply. What's remarkable here is that Maggie not only manages to accurately predict the number of bastard children Robert would have as well as how many Cersei herself would have, but she also makes a point of distinguishing two separate issues and therefore foretells Cersei's relationship with Jaime. What's even more significant, however, is that although Cersei's three questions are up, 
Maggie is not done speaking and goes on to foretell the deaths of Cersei's children, as well as Cersei's death at the hands of the Valonqar. The first line clearly refers to the deaths of Cersei's children, and considering that Joffrey has already bit the bullet at this point, this leaves only Tommen and Marcella, who according to Maggie will both be crowned before their subsequent deaths. The second line, and what many would agree is the most crucial element of the prophecy as it predicts Cersei's own demise, foretells of the Valonqar. What is the Valonqar, you may ask? Well, according to Septa Serenella, a former Septa of Cersei's at Casterly Rock, it's the High Valyrian word for little brother. And although Cersei is the eldest of her siblings with two younger brothers, she has always assumed that the Valonqar refers to Tyrion. So essentially, Maggie's prophecy foretells three crucial events which as of a dance with dragons have yet to occur. The first being the appearance of a younger and more beautiful queen who will cast Cersei down and take all that she holds dear. The second being the crowning and subsequent deaths of Cersei's remaining two children, Tommen and Marcella. And the third being the death of Cersei herself at the hands of the Valonqar. So now that we have taken a look at the prophecy itself, let's take a further look and attempt to determine what it's actually implying. First, let's consider the identity of the younger, more beautiful queen. Now, because Maggie's words are so vague here and because there are still several other claimants to the Iron Throne, the queen Maggie refers to really could be anyone, but it's important to note that at the start of A Feast for Crows, Cersei is convinced that the younger and more beautiful queen is Marjorie Tyrell. But to be fair, although Cersei's paranoia is slightly over the top, her beliefs are not completely unfounded. For instance, after the death of her father, Cersei finds a type of gold coin once issued by House Gardner in the cell of the missing jailer, Rugen. Why is this significant? Well, before the War of Conquest, House Gardner were kings of the Reach, and House Tyrell were merely their stewards. The gold coin which is found in Rugen's cell is from that time period. When presented with this coin, Cersei immediately recalls that Lady Olenna Tyrell is known for keeping these coins and reputedly still uses them as they look similar to but way less than gold dragons, the current currency in Westeros, and therefore allow her to rip off various merchants in King's Landing. Now we know that Rugen is actually one of Varys' disguises, and in the final chapter of A Dance with Dragons, Varys admits that he has been purposely sowing the seeds of tension and animosity between Houses Lannister and Tyrell. Now, of course, those of you who are up to date with A Feast for Crows and A Dance with Dragons, you will know that Cersei's tumultuous relationship with Marjorie has led to her upcoming trial, in which both Cersei and Marjorie face the possibility of execution. If Cersei's champion is defeated in her trial by combat, it's likely that due to the various charges against her such as murder, treason, and fornication, both her children and Jaime could possibly face persecution. With all this being said, however, George R. R. Martin has recently commented on the Maggie the Frog prophecy stating the following. Now, I don't know about you, but to me this makes things even more ambiguous and vague. For instance, George alludes that the prophecy will possibly come true, but in an unexpected way. And so this could rule out Marjorie as a possible red herring to both Cersei and the reader. But then he also goes on to mention that Cersei could possibly unconsciously fulfill the prophecy in her efforts to avoid it. Which, due to the current state of affairs, does seem to place Marjorie as the most likely of candidates. However, seeing as the outcome of Cersei's trial and her position in King's Landing are uncertain, this still leaves a few other options for the role of the younger queen. The first of these would be Daenerys Targaryen, seeing as, apart from Marjorie, she is the only other acknowledged younger queen in A Song of Ice and Fire. And it could also be very fitting considering Danny's deep-seated hatred for the Lannisters. Jaime would likely be the first to go as he's responsible for her father's death, whereas it's probable that Danny could show mercy to Cersei and simply imprison her. But although Danny would certainly remove Tommen from the throne and Marcella from the line of succession, it's unlikely that she would kill or even harm Cersei's children. The reason for this being that Danny has often viewed children as being the innocent bystanders of war and conflict. And during her stint in Marine, she had become accustomed to taking the children of prominent noble families as hostages in the form of cupbearers. And so it's likely she'll do the same with Tommen and Marcella. And because it's not foretold that Cersei's children necessarily have to die at the hands of the younger, more beautiful queen, it could just be that taking Tommen and Marcella away from Cersei would be punishment enough. But the major spanner in this theory is that apart from it being far too obvious of a choice, Cersei's downfall seems too imminent, and it's unlikely that Danny will reach Westeros in such a short span of time. 
In truth, her entire story arc seems to be leading up to something much more significant, and we see this in the vision of the House of the Undying, in which it's implied that Dany will most likely not sit on the Iron Throne, and so it's unlikely that she will fulfill the role of a younger, more beautiful queen. However, there are a few other more minor characters who could possibly fulfill this role, and the first of these would be Sansa Stark. Now, there are a few obvious reasons for this choice. For instance, Sansa does have several reasons for wanting to cast down Cersei, the murder of her father, mother, and brother, for starters. Not to mention that Sansa is no longer the timid and naive girl she once was. In truth, she is proving to be more and more adept at playing the Game of Thrones, making her a more than worthy adversary for Cersei Lannister. And it's also becoming very likely that Sansa will become queen in the north. And with queenship comes Vannermint. So if Queen Sansa and her northern army were to march in King's Landing, naturally there would be severe consequences for House Lannister. And in regards to Jaime, for those of you who are up to date on Jaime's story arc, you will know that Jaime is in many ways trying to fulfill the oath he made to Catelyn Stark. So if Jaime were to somehow meet up with Sansa and pledge allegiance to her in the north, it would result in another major blow to Cersei. Another possible queen would be Aryan Martell. Because those of you who are up to date on the whole Aegon Targaryen plotline, you will know that towards the end of A Dance with Dragons, Aegon has landed in Westeros and has requested for the allegiance of House Dorne. Now, Prince Doran Martell has expressed his desire for vengeance, fire, and blood before. I mean, just take a look at this epic quote. In fact, Doran has already sent out Aryan to investigate Aegon's claim on his behalf. And if Aryan does determine Aegon to be the son of Prince Rhaegar Targaryen and Elia Martell, it's likely that she will offer her hand in marriage. And if Aegon plans on securing Dorne's allegiance prior to taking the Iron Throne, it's likely that he will need to award Dorne's loyalty with a marriage alliance. Hence the very likely possibility of Aryan becoming Aegon's queen. However, although Aryan could be responsible for casting Cersei down, it is unlikely that Aryan's arrival would be responsible for the breakdown of Cersei's relationship with Jaime or the death of her children. So overall, although Aryan certainly fits the description, she's young, beautiful, and very likely to be a future queen, she doesn't fulfill Maggie's prophecy absolutely. Which then leads us to our next and final choice, Jane Westerling. Now, due to her current circumstances, Jane is probably the most uncertain out of all the choices for the younger, more beautiful queen. But for those of you who are only familiar with the Game of Thrones HBO series, Jane in a Storm of Swords, in an act to avoid any further offense to Lord Walder Frey, did not actually accompany Rob to the twins, but you're also likely to be familiar with the events and aftermath of the Red Wedding, as with Rob's death, the Stark stronghold in the north ceased to exist. And although there still remain northern lords loyal to House Stark, such men would only be willing to pledge fealty to a Stark. Which brings me to one of the great points of contention and dispute in A Song of Ice and Fire. Is Jane Westerling pregnant? To be honest, at this point, we can't be sure. For instance, in A Feast for Crows, we learn that despite Jane and Rob's numerous attempts to conceive an heir, Sybil Westerling, Jane's mother, under the guise of aiding her with fertility potions, had actually been giving her moon tea, a very effective contraceptive. According to Sybil, this betrayal was orchestrated with Tywin Lannister, with the understanding that in return for her cooperation, the Westerlings would receive a full pardoning for allying with Rob Stark and advantageous marriages for all their children. Now, regarding Sybil herself, there is one weird coincidence that is worth noting. This being that before her marriage to Gowan Westerling, Sybil was a member of House Spicer, and therefore the granddaughter of Maggie the Frog. Fancy that, huh? And so this could in some strange way tie into the Maggie the Frog prophecy. Perhaps Sybil is aware of the prophecy and therefore also aware that her daughter could one day become the younger, more beautiful queen. But based on the points discussed so far, one could assume that at this point, Jane is most likely not pregnant. Some readers, however, still insist that Jane's sister Elena is mysteriously missing during the meeting between the Westerlings and Jamie Lannister, which has led some to theorize that Jane and Elena could have been switched, and a pregnant Jane is secretly in hiding with Sir Brendan Tully. So what does Jane's possible pregnancy and escape mean, and how does it relate to the Maggie the Frog prophecy? Well, as stated before, Jane Westerling could possibly be the younger, more beautiful queen, considering that if she is pregnant with Rob Stark's heir, the majority of the northern houses, secretly opposed to the Boltons and the Crown, would rise up to her cause to reclaim the north for the Starks. And if the Blackfish and Jane Westerling were to succeed in this, it's likely that the remaining aspects of Maggie's prophecy regarding the younger, more beautiful queen would also be fulfilled. 
For instance, as stated before, Cersei holds most dear power, her children, and her brother Jaime. And if Jane were to reclaim the North for her son, it's likely that a war with the crown would once again ensue, possibly leading to the removal of Cersei as Queen Regent and the death of her remaining children and Jaime Lannister. So, to summarize, the most likely of candidates for the younger, more beautiful queen would be either Marjorie Tyrell, Sansa Stark, or Arion Martell. Because although both Daenerys Targaryen and Jane Westerling could prove to be major threats down the road, their current storylines do not seem to be leading towards fulfilling this role. So, now that we have covered the younger, more beautiful queen, let's take a look at the final and most intriguing aspect of Maggie's prophecy. The foretelling of the Valonqar. Now, if you recall, Maggie made this prophecy after Cersei's three questions had been answered. But whereas with the foretelling about the younger, more beautiful queen, we could determine the meaning quite easily, this particular foretelling is much more ambiguous. For instance, every aspect of this prophecy could have several different meanings. The tears, for instance, could literally be referring to Cersei's actual tears, because as prophesied, at this point she will have lost her children and everything else she holds dear. But the tears could also be referring to the tears of Lys, as Cersei has been known to resort to these desperate measures before, during Stannis' attack on King's Landing. The last part of this prophecy refers to a Valonqar, who will wrap his hands about Cersei's pale throat and choke the life from her. So let's once again begin with the two most obvious choices, Cersei's two younger brothers, Tyrion and Jaime Lannister. Tyrion is Cersei's personal choice for the Valonqar, and has been for many years, possibly even from the time of his birth. And this is likely due to the unfortunate circumstance that as Tyrion arrived into the world, his mother exited. And this event probably led Cersei to very early on associate Tyrion with death and misfortune, leading the relationship between Cersei and Tyrion to be overly strained and difficult, to the point where they both begin to account the other for every misfortune that happens to befall them. And it also doesn't help Tyrion's case that he made this little threat a while ago. But if we once again recall George's words, and so Tyrion's part in Cersei's death could once again be Cersei's own doing. And to be honest, it already seems to be heading in that direction in many ways, once again becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy, as throughout Tyrion's point of view chapters in A Dance with the Dragons, he states a number of times how much he would like to kill not only Cersei, but Jaime as well. And so, as with Melara and perhaps even Marjorie, Cersei could once again lead this prophecy to fulfill itself. Now, although Tyrion certainly seems to fit nicely with the prophecy, as with Marjorie fulfilling the role of the younger queen, the drawback is that it's just too obvious. Which leads us to a few other options. The first of which would be Cersei's other little brother, Jaime Lannister. Now, for those of you who only watch the HBO series, Jaime is probably not an obvious choice. As is the case for Cersei, as her hatred of Tyrion and entitled beliefs regarding Jaime lead her to completely overlook him. Whereas for those of you who have read Jaime's several point of view chapters in A Feast for Crows, you will know that Jamie's perceptions of Cersei have changed dramatically, leading up to a final breaking point in which she decides not to come to her aid during one of her most desperate moments. We also know that in Jamie's final point of view chapter in A Dance with Dragons, we see him leaving Riveron with Brienne, possibly being led into a trap set up by Lady Stoneheart and the Brotherhood Without Banners. Now, it could turn out that Jamie will join forces with Lady Stoneheart and the Brotherhood, if he is somehow spared, which I know is unlikely, but bear with me here. And this could then lead to Jaime utilizing the Lannister army and restoring the Riverlands to Tully rule. And although Jaime has done some pretty immoral things in his past, you know, the whole pushing a child out a window, lying to Tyrion about Tisha, raping his sister, that kind of thing, he also has shown to have a very strong moral compass when being faced with some very difficult situations. So as he becomes aware of Cersei's actions, it could be that he will feel compelled to act and end the suffering of the people of Westeros. With all this being said, however, there is a slight issue where Jaime only has one hand. And if we look closely at Maggie's words, the prophecy clearly states, his hands being plural. And although it's not necessarily implied that these must be actual hands rather than artificial hands, these hands would still require the Valonqar to effectively choke the life out of Cersei. And as we know from the various descriptions of Jamie's golden hand, it does not seem capable of doing a lot, much less being used to strangle someone to death. With all this being said, however, although there seems to be quite a hefty amount of textual support for Jamie being the Valonqar, 
Jamie Storyark seems to be leading him towards a very tumultuous meeting with Lady Stoneheart, of which the outcome at this point is uncertain. But if Lady Stoneheart does decide to spare Jamie's life, it is unlikely to be out of empathy, but for Jamie to serve a greater purpose. And this could either be to find her daughters or to kill Cersei Lannister in order to spare Brienne's life. If, however, Jamie does not survive his meeting with Lady Stoneheart, it would certainly be apt considering Cersei's upcoming trial if their deaths were to be closely timed together, as their births once were. This outcome, however, would still leave open the role of the Valonqar, in which case there are a few more options we could consider. The first of these being Stannis Baratheon. Now, apart from the obvious reasons for this option, such as his relentless quest for the Iron Throne and his hatred for the Lannisters, the foretelling of the prophecy does not mention that the Valonqar must be Cersei's own brother, and therefore this opens up the identity of the little brother to a number of different potential candidates, including Stannis. But apart from this, an interesting point to acknowledge is that Maggie's words regarding the Valonqar immediately follow her foretelling about Robert and Cersei's children. It is likely that the Valonqar could possibly be motivated by the illegitimacy of Cersei's children, rather than just being some random add-on prophecy foretelling Cersei's death. And if we recall, it was indeed Stannis who originally suspected the illegitimacy of Cersei's children. And if we look at the current state of affairs in Westeros, Stannis is looking very likely to win the Battle of Winterfell. And so with the North in the bag, it is likely that Stannis will continue south to King's Landing. And although Stannis has previously failed to take King's Landing, with Jaime currently being MIA, the deaths of both Tywin and Kevin Lannister, and the entirety of the Lannister forces currently camping in the Riverlands, this leaves Cersei and the Lannister rule in King's Landing very vulnerable. The only drawback to this theory, however, seems to be that not only is Stannis currently tied up in the North, but he also seems to have had a bit of a midlife crisis, in which he has decided that his place is in the North, in the role of Azor Ahai, to defeat the others. And so if and when he does decide to head south, Cersei may already be dead. Which then leads us to our final candidate for the Valonqar, Sandor Clegane, the Hound. So by now most of you have probably heard of the Gravedigger Theory, which claims that Sandor Clegane, after suffering his various injuries in his fight at the inn, or if you only watched the show, his fight with Brienne, did not actually die but was discovered by the elder brother from the Quiet Isle and nursed back to health. And it's at the Quiet Isle where he now resides, disguised as a gravedigger. But how does this all tie into Maggie's prophecy? Well, those of you up to date with Cersei's point of view chapters in A Feast for Crows and A Dance with Dragons will know that Cersei currently faces a trial by combat and has chosen Sir Robert Strong as her champion. Now, it's pretty safe to say that Sir Robert Strong is really Sir Gregor Clegane, also known as the Mountain, as it's assumed that Kyburn practices necromancy and has transformed Gregor into Frankenstein for Cersei. And as mentioned earlier, because the prophecy does not state that the Valonqar must be Cersei's own brother, this could lead to Sandor Clegane, the younger brother of Gregor Clegane, fulfilling the role. Now, if the Gravedigger really is the Hound and has therefore been hiding out in a monastery, it's possible that he may have turned to religion and therefore feel compelled to defend the faith. And perhaps when learning of Sir Robert Strong's appearance, he will instinctively know it could only be his brother. However, the slight issue with this option is the question of whether becoming the face champion Sander would actually be fulfilling the role of the prophecy. Because although he may succeed in actually killing his brother Gregor Clegane, his defeat would only result in sentencing Cersei to death, and so he would not actually be directly killing her. So, to sum things up, the most likely candidates for the younger, more beautiful queen would either be Marjorie Tyrell or Sansa Stark, whereas the most likely candidates for the Valonqar are probably either Tyrion or Stannis. This being because although both Marjorie and Tyrion are both overly obvious choices, George R.R. R. Martin has implied that in her attempts to hinder the prophecy, Cersei might actually fulfill Maggie's prophecy. But if this is not the case, Sansa and Stannis would be my second choices, based on their motivations, character arcs, and current circumstances. With all this speculation aside, however, there is also the debate of the prophecy itself. There seem to be quite a few in A Song of Ice and Fire, but none have yet to fully come true. And so the question remains, will Maggie's prophecy be fulfilled, or will Cersei succeed in her attempts in altering her future? So that's it for the Maggie the Frog prophecy for now, but as it's one of the few prophecies that David and Dan have decided to really focus on, I'm sure we'll be seeing more of it in the upcoming episodes of Season 5. But until then, feel free to let me know your opinions and thoughts on the prophecy in the comments below.
And if you enjoyed watching this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, guys.